It was a chilly October night, the kind where the cold breeze bites through your jacket and nips at your skin. I had just finished a long day at work and figured I could squeeze in a few more Uber rides before calling it a night. The app was surprisingly busy, even for a Thursday, but hey, who was I to complain? More rides meant more cash. The notification dinged on my phone, ping ride request. The pickup was about 15 minutes away, deep in a quiet part of town I didn't usually venture into. It was that part of the city where the houses are few and far between, trees overgrown, and streets only lit by the faint moonlight. The fare looked decent though, so I accepted it without a second thought. Plus the streets were almost empty. Quick, easy money, or so I thought. As I pulled up to the location, I glanced around. There was no one in sight. I double-checked the address on my phone, sure I was at the right place. Still, no sign of life. I thought to myself, maybe they're running late? After all, who hasn't ordered an Uber and then forgotten to leave the house? I waited a couple of minutes then sent a quick message through the app. Hi, I'm here. I stared at the screen, waiting for the little dots that show someone's typing, but nothing came. I was about to cancel the ride when I saw movement in the rearview mirror. A shadow was slowly approaching the car from behind. At first I couldn't make out any details, just the dark outline of a person. As they got closer, I started to feel... off. There was something about the way they moved, almost too slow, too deliberate. The kind of slow that creeps under your skin and makes you want to lock all your doors. And believe me, I did. Instinctively, I hit the lock button on my door. I wasn't about to take any chances. The figure finally reached the car. A man, or at least I assumed it was a man, wearing a hood so low I couldn't see his face. He slid into the back seat without a word. Usually people say something when they get in, right? A casual hey, or at least a hi. But no, not this guy. He just sat there, breathing softly, like he'd been doing this forever. I forced a smile and glanced back at him through the rearview mirror. Where to? For a moment there was silence. Then, in the softest, creepiest voice I've ever heard, he muttered, Just drive. All right, that's not ominous at all, I thought sarcastically. My stomach nodded up, but I forced another smile. I've dealt with weird riders before, no biggie. I started driving. He didn't give me an exact address, just a vague direction. Head north. As we drove deeper into the quiet, desolate streets, I couldn't help but notice how isolated everything felt. No cars, no houses, just endless roads and trees. I tried to make small talk to shake off the uncomfortable silence. So, long night? No response. Busy day? Nothing. Okay, cool, cool. We'll just drive in total silence then, I mumbled to myself. I peeked at the guy in the mirror again. He was just sitting there, motionless, like a statue. His hood still covered his face, and I couldn't see much. The only thing I noticed was his hands, pale and thin, resting on his lap. They didn't look like hands that did much manual work, almost like they hadn't seen daylight in years. A chill ran down my spine, but I pushed the thought away. Maybe he was just socially awkward. Yeah, that had to be it. Suddenly the guy spoke again. Turn left. I followed his directions turning onto a narrower road, one that led into the forested outskirts of town. Trees loomed over us, their branches like skeletal arms reaching for the car. The road became bumpier, potholes littered everywhere. No streetlights, no signs of civilization. Um, where exactly are we headed? I asked, trying to keep the nerves out of my voice. Keep driving, he replied. This was getting weirder by the minute. My heart started to race, and every instinct screamed at me to turn the car around and get the heck out of there. But I kept driving, not knowing what else to do. I mean, I could have cancelled the ride, but then what? Leave this creepy dude in the middle of nowhere? Nah, I wasn't about to get some bad rating on my Uber profile because of that. We drove for what felt like an eternity, deeper and deeper into the woods. My gas tank was starting to run low, and panic began to set in. The guy hadn't said another word, and I was seriously starting to wonder if I was going to end up on the nightly news as that missing Uber driver. Suddenly, he leaned forward, close enough that I could feel his breath on the back of my neck. Stop here. I slammed the brakes, 
my heart nearly jumping out of my chest. I was on high alert now, scanning the area for any sign of what was about to happen next. We were in the middle of nowhere. No houses, no lights, just trees and darkness. The man slowly reached for the door handle, and I half expected him to pull out some weapon or something. But instead, he just opened the door, stepped out, and stood there. He didn't walk away. He just stood there, staring at the car, or maybe at me. I couldn't tell. Uh, you sure this is where you want to get dropped off? I asked, trying to sound casual but failing miserably. He didn't answer. He just closed the door gently and stood there, his back to me. My fingers hovered over the gear shift, ready to peel out of there, but I hesitated. Something didn't feel right. Something felt very, very wrong. Then, out of nowhere, he turned around and started walking toward the front of the car. My breath caught in my throat as he moved closer, his hood still covering most of his face. He reached the driver's side window, leaned down, and for the first time, I could see his eyes, dark, hollow, like black pits. My skin crawled. Don't look back, he whispered, his voice barely audible. And then, he was gone. Just like that, he vanished into the woods, swallowed by the darkness. I didn't even see where he went. One second he was there, the next, gone. My hands were shaking so badly I could barely grip the steering wheel. I didn't need to be told twice. I floored it, speeding down the dirt road, desperate to get back to some semblance of civilization. My mind raced with questions, but one thing was clear. I wasn't about to stop and look back. Nope, not risking it. When I finally made it back to the main road, my body was still trembling. I pulled over, took a few deep breaths, and glanced at my phone. The app was still tracking the trip, but here's the kicker. The destination. It was my house. I stared at the screen in disbelief. No way. There was no way I had entered that address. My fingers fumbled as I tried to cancel the ride, but the app froze, refusing to close. My heart pounded in my ears. And then, in the distance, I saw headlights approaching from the rearview mirror. A car, moving slowly, too slowly, down the empty road behind me. My phone buzzed again. Ping. New ride request. I didn't dare look back. Driving a truck at night is usually peaceful. No traffic, no loud honking, just the hum of the engine and the empty road ahead. Most people imagine truckers just cruise through the night with nothing much happening, but that's because they haven't lived through the things that come out when the sun goes down. Let me tell you about the night I wish I could forget, but it's burned into my memory. I had a long haul that night, a late delivery across a stretch of highway that cut through endless miles of nothing but trees, mountains, and tiny forgotten towns. The kind of place where, if you broke down, good luck finding help before morning. The weather report had warned of thick fog rolling in after midnight, but I figured I'd be far enough along by then to miss the worst of it. I was wrong. So, so wrong. The night started out normal. I had my thermos of bad coffee, my playlist queued up, and the dashboard lights casting a faint green glow inside the cab. The road was straight and smooth, and for the first couple of hours, I barely had to touch the wheel. But then, just as midnight hit, the fog started rolling in like some silent beast creeping across the landscape. At first it wasn't too bad, just light wisps swirling around the tires. But as the minutes ticked by, the fog thickened, swallowing the road and turning everything into a soupy mess. My headlights barely cut through it, making it feel like I was driving through a cloud. The kind of cloud that's up to no good. I slowed down, gripping the wheel a little tighter. There was no one else on the road, no cars in sight, which should have been a relief, but instead, it made things worse. The silence of the road, combined with the heavy fog, made it feel like I was the only person left in the world. It was unsettling, to say the least. Then, out of nowhere, my radio, completely unprovoked, crackled to life. Static hissed through the speakers before it settled on some garbled voice. I couldn't make out what it was saying, but it sounded distant, like someone whispering through a tin can. I reached out and turned the dial, but the voice wouldn't go away. It just lingered, mumbling something I couldn't understand. Great. Just what I needed. Some broken radio spooking me out. 
Suddenly, through the haze of the fog, I saw something in the distance, a shape on the side of the road. At first I thought it was an animal, maybe a deer, which wouldn't be unusual out here. But as I got closer, I realized it wasn't a deer. It was a man, just standing there. No car, no bike, nothing. Just a guy in an old brown jacket, standing on the shoulder of a road no one else was on, staring into the fog. My first thought was that maybe his car had broken down further up the road, or he was stranded. But there was no car, no sign of a wreck, nothing that would explain why this man was out here, in the middle of nowhere, just standing there like he was waiting for something, or someone. I slowed down as I passed him, glancing over my shoulder, but he didn't move. He didn't even acknowledge my truck rolling by, didn't wave, didn't ask for help, just stood there, staring into the fog. Now, I'm not the type to leave a guy stranded, but there was something about him that made every instinct in me scream to keep driving. So I did. I kept going, my hands gripping the wheel tighter as the figure disappeared into the fog behind me. I was starting to feel the unease creep into my bones. My coffee had gone cold, and I couldn't shake the feeling that something wasn't right. The fog was thickening, my visibility reduced to practically nothing. The road twisted and turned and every shadow looked like it was about to come alive. Then, just when I thought things couldn't get worse, I saw it. Another figure standing on the side of the road. This time, it wasn't a man. It was a woman, dressed in a pale, flowing dress, her hair hanging limply over her face. She was standing in the exact same spot where the man had been. I slammed on the brakes, my truck screeching to a halt. What the hell, I muttered to myself. The fog swirled around her, making it hard to tell if she was real or if my mind was playing tricks on me. But she didn't move, didn't react, just stood there like she'd been planted there, waiting for me. I didn't dare roll down the window or open the door. Instead, I slowly, cautiously, pressed the gas and moved forward. But as I did, I could swear, no, I'm sure. I saw her lift her head, just enough for me to see her eyes, dark and hollow, staring right at me through the fog. I floored it. The truck roared to life and I sped down the highway, my heart pounding in my chest. What was going on? Who were those people? And why did they seem to be waiting for me? I glanced in the rearview mirror, half expecting to see her standing in the road behind me, but there was nothing. Just fog and the empty highway stretching behind me. For a few miles, things seemed to settle down. The fog wasn't quite as thick, and I managed to calm down a little. Maybe I was just tired. Maybe the fog was messing with my head. That's what I told myself anyway. But deep down, I knew something was off. Something I couldn't explain. Then, it happened again. The radio crackled back to life, this time louder, more insistent. The same static-filled voice, whispering something I couldn't understand. I reached for the dial to turn it off, but just as I touched it, the headlights of my truck flickered. Once, twice, and then they went out. I was plunged into total darkness. The road, the fog, the trees, everything disappeared. All I had was the sound of my engine and the eerie static from the radio. Come on, come on, I muttered, fumbling with the dashboard, trying to get the lights back on. My heart was racing and panic was setting in. I couldn't see a thing. The truck kept moving, but I had no idea where I was headed. Then, just as suddenly as they'd gone out, the lights flickered back on, and there, standing in the middle of the road, was the man. The same man from before, still in that old brown jacket, standing dead center in my lane. I had no time to react. I slammed on the brakes, but the truck wasn't stopping fast enough. The tires screeched, and I braced for impact, but it never came. The man vanished. One second he was there, the next, he was gone, swallowed by the fog. I stared in disbelief, my hands gripping the wheel so tight my knuckles were white. What the hell was happening? I took a deep breath and looked around. The road was empty again, the fog slowly beginning to lift, but I knew better than to think that meant I was safe. I didn't stop. I didn't slow down. I just drove. Faster than I probably should have. Desperate to get away from whatever the hell was out there. As I neared the next town, the fog finally broke. The road was clear, 
and the familiar glow of streetlights appeared in the distance. I breathed a sigh of relief, knowing I was almost out of this nightmare. But just as I reached the edge of town, I saw something that sent a shiver down my spine. There, standing on the side of the road, under the dim glow of a streetlight, was the woman. The same woman, in the same pale dress, with the same lifeless eyes, staring right at me as I drove past. I didn't stop. I didn't look back. And I haven't driven through that stretch of road at night since. One of those nights where you're wide awake, buzzing with restless energy, and you just know you're not going to fall asleep anytime soon. That was me, Sarah, on a particularly boring Friday night. The clock ticked past midnight, and I was staring at the ceiling, counting the cracks in the plaster. Suddenly, an idea struck me. A road trip. Not just any road trip, but a spontaneous, middle-of-the-night adventure. It was the perfect cure for my boredom. I grabbed my keys, threw on a hoodie, and headed out the door, leaving a note for my roommate that read, Gone on an adventure. Be back soon. The highway was blissfully empty, the only sound the gentle hum of my car's engine and the occasional whoosh of a passing truck. The moon was full, casting a silvery glow over the landscape, making everything seem both beautiful and slightly eerie. I drove for hours, the miles blurring together, my mind wandering. I sang along to the radio at the top of my lungs, enjoying the freedom of the open road. It was the kind of night where anything seemed possible. As the night wore on, however, a sense of unease started to creep in. The radio stations began to fade, replaced by static. The once bright moon seemed to dim, casting long shadows that danced in my peripheral vision. I shook my head, trying to dispel the growing sense of dread. It was just my imagination, playing tricks on me. I was an independent woman, not afraid of a little darkness. Then, I saw it. Up ahead, a figure stood in the middle of the road, bathed in the dim glow of my headlights. A shiver ran down my spine. I slowed down, squinting to make out the shape. It was a man, tall and slender, dressed in a long, dark coat. His face was hidden in shadow, but I could make out a pair of glowing red eyes fixed on me. Panic flooded my senses. I slammed on the brakes, my car screeching to a halt just a few feet away from the figure. He didn't move, his eyes burning into mine. I fumbled for my phone, my hands shaking. I tried to dial 911, but there was no signal. I was alone, miles from civilization, with a thing blocking my path. The figure began to walk towards me, its movements slow and deliberate. I locked the doors, my heart pounding in my chest. It reached my car and placed its long, bony hands on the hood. The car shook violently, as if the figure was trying to rip it apart. I screamed, pressing my foot on the gas pedal, but the car wouldn't budge. Suddenly, the figure's face appeared at my window. Its skin was pale and translucent, its mouth stretched into a grotesque grin. You shouldn't be out here alone, it rasped its voice like nails on a chalkboard. I whimpered, frozen in fear. The figure reached for the door handle. I squeezed my eyes shut, bracing for the worst. But then, there was a blinding flash of light, followed by a deafening roar. I opened my eyes to see a semi-truck barreling down the highway, its headlights illuminating the figure. The figure vanished, disappearing into the darkness as quickly as it had appeared. The truck driver honked his horn, waving at me as he passed. I sat there for a moment, my heart still racing, before slowly pulling back onto the road. I drove home in silence, the events of the night replaying in my mind. I had been so close to... something. I didn't know what it was, but I knew I never wanted to encounter it again. The next morning, I woke up feeling shaken, but also strangely exhilarated. I had survived a night I would never forget. The midnight road trip had turned out to be a journey I barely survived, but it had also taught me a valuable lesson. 
Sometimes, the most thrilling adventures are the ones that push us to our limits and remind us how precious life is. And so, I went about my day, a little wiser, a little braver, and with a newfound appreciation for the safety of my own bed. The end. The desolate highway stretched out before me, a ribbon of asphalt cutting through the inky blackness of the night. The headlights of my car, the only source of light for miles, cast dancing shadows on the barren landscape. A sense of unease gnawed at me, amplified by the oppressive silence that enveloped the car. I was driving back from a late-night business meeting, a journey I'd made countless times before. But tonight, something felt different. The familiar route seemed alien, the darkness pressing in on all sides. I tried to shake off the feeling, attributing it to fatigue, but it clung to me like a shroud. A glance at the dashboard clock told me it was well past midnight. I yawned, my eyelids heavy, and decided to pull over at the next rest stop for a quick nap. The prospect of a few hours of sleep was tempting, even if it meant arriving home a bit later than planned. A sign appeared in the distance, announcing the upcoming rest stop. Relief washed over me as I steered the car off the highway and into the dimly lit parking lot. It was eerily deserted, not a single other vehicle in sight. The silence was so profound it felt almost tangible. I parked the car near the restroom building, its fluorescent lights casting an eerie glow on the surrounding pavement. I locked the doors and settled into the driver's seat, adjusting it to a reclining position. The hum of the engine faded as I turned it off, and the silence grew even more oppressive. I closed my eyes, trying to relax, but my mind was racing. Images of shadowy figures lurking in the darkness flashed before my eyes, fueled by the unsettling atmosphere of the deserted rest stop. I tried to dismiss them as mere figments of my imagination, but the fear lingered. After what felt like an eternity, I finally drifted off to sleep. But my slumber was fitful, plagued by disturbing dreams. In one particularly vivid nightmare, I was being chased through a dark forest by an unseen entity, its presence marked only by the snapping of twigs and the rustling of leaves. I woke with a start, my heart pounding in my chest. I glanced at the clock. It was just past 3 a.m. I decided to call it a night and get back on the road. I started the engine and pulled out of the parking lot, eager to leave the eerie rest stop behind. As I merged back onto the highway, I noticed a car in my rearview mirror, its headlights glaring. It was traveling at a high speed, closing the distance between us rapidly. I pressed down on the accelerator, hoping to put some distance between us. But the car kept pace. My heart hammered in my chest as I glanced in the mirror again. The car was even closer now, its headlights blinding me. I felt a surge of panic, my hands gripping the steering wheel tightly. Suddenly, the car swerved into the lane beside me, its driver flashing their high beams. I squinted, trying to make out the figure behind the wheel, but the glare was too intense. A wave of fear washed over me. Who was this person? Why were they following me? The car pulled ahead, then abruptly slowed down, forcing me to brake hard. I cursed under my breath, my anxiety escalating. The car continued to weave in and out of traffic, its erratic movements making my stomach churn. I reached for my phone, intending to call the police, but my hands were shaking too badly. I tried to focus on the road, but the car in front of me was a constant distraction. It was like a predator toying with its prey, keeping me on edge, waiting for the opportune moment to strike. The highway seemed to stretch on endlessly, the darkness pressing in on all sides. I felt trapped, my options dwindling with each passing mile. The car in front of me continued its menacing dance, its driver seemingly relishing my fear. Just when I thought I couldn't take it anymore, the car veered off the highway, disappearing into the darkness. I let out a shaky breath, relief washing over me. But the feeling was short-lived. A few miles down the road I saw flashing lights in the distance. A police car was parked on the shoulder, 
its siren wailing. I slowed down, my heart pounding. Had they seen the car that was following me? Were they coming to my rescue? As I approached the police car, a sense of dread washed over me. The officer standing beside it was the same figure I had seen behind the wheel of the car that had been tormenting me. His face was contorted in a sinister grin, his eyes gleaming in the flashing lights. I slammed on the brakes, my car skidding to a halt. I threw the car into reverse, desperate to escape, but it was too late. The officer was already striding towards me, his hand resting on his holstered gun. I fumbled with the door handle, my fingers numb with fear. The officer reached my car, his grin widening. He tapped on the window, his eyes locked with mine. I shrank back in my seat, paralyzed with terror. Do you know how fast you were going? He asked, his voice a low growl. I shook my head, unable to speak. You were speeding, he said, his grin turning into a sneer. And that's a serious offense. He pulled out his gun, pointing it at me. I screamed, my voice echoing in the empty night. The officer laughed, a cold, cruel sound that chilled me to the bone. It's time to pay the price, he said, his finger tightening on the trigger. The last thing I saw was the flash of the gun, followed by a deafening roar. Then, everything went black. So there I was, driving down this long, dark highway in the middle of nowhere. It was one of those roads that stretch on for miles with nothing but trees, more trees, and maybe a raccoon or two if you're lucky enough to spot them. You know the type. And of course, it was raining. Because what would a creepy night on the highway be without a torrential downpour to make things just a little more interesting, right? I wasn't going anywhere exciting, just heading back from a weekend trip to visit some friends. They live in a small town that's so far off the map, you'd swear the GPS made it up just to mess with you. Anyway, it was late, and all I wanted to do was get home, throw on some comfy pajamas, and collapse into bed. As I drove, I noticed something in the rearview mirror. At first, I thought it was just the rain playing tricks on me, but then, well, I saw it again. It was a person, a figure standing on the side of the road, right in the middle of nowhere. The headlights caught just enough of them to make out the shape of a long coat and a hat. You know, classic ghost attire. Now, I'm not one to believe in ghosts. I mean, sure, I've heard stories, watched a few horror movies, but I always figured it was all just made-up nonsense. But seeing that figure in the rain, on this dark and lonely highway, yeah, that sent a chill down my spine. I did what any sensible person would do in that situation. I sped up, like seriously sped up. I wasn't about to stop and ask if they needed a ride or anything. Nope, not today, ghostly hitchhiker. But here's where things got really weird. I glanced back at the rear view mirror again, just out of habit, and the figure was gone, just vanished into thin air. I let out a small laugh trying to brush it off. Maybe my eyes were playing tricks on me, I thought. Or maybe it was just a weird shadow from the rain. Yeah, that had to be it. But just as I was calming down and telling myself that I was being ridiculous, something caught my eye again. This time, though, it wasn't outside. No, it was inside the car. The back seat, to be precise. You know that feeling when you're sure someone is staring at you? The hairs on the back of your neck stand up. Your skin gets all tingly, and your brain goes into full-on fight-or-flight mode. Well, that's exactly what happened to me. Only problem was, I was stuck in a car, on a highway, in the middle of a storm. So the whole flight thing wasn't really an option. Against my better judgment, I slowly turned my head to glance at the back seat. And there, sitting calmly as if they'd been there the entire time, was the same figure I'd seen on the side of the road. Hat, coat, dripping wet. Yep, it was definitely the same ghostly figure. Now, let me tell you, there's nothing quite like the feeling of realizing you have an unexpected passenger, especially when that passenger happens to be a ghost. I opened my mouth to scream, but all that came out was this pathetic little squeak. 
Seriously, not my finest moment. The figure didn't move, didn't say a word. Just sat there, staring straight ahead, like they were waiting for me to do something. What was I supposed to do? Offer them a snack? Ask them where they were heading? Maybe they just wanted a ride into town? Who knows? But then, just as I was about to pull over and make a run for it, the figure spoke. You missed your turn, they said, in this deep, gravelly voice that sounded like it had been pulled straight out of a horror movie. I blinked. What? Your turn, the figure repeated, sounding mildly annoyed. You're going to miss it. I glanced at the GPS, and sure enough, I was about to miss my exit. How the ghost knew this, I had no idea. But in my panicked state, I swerved onto the exit ramp just in time. The car bounced a little, and I felt a brief surge of relief. At least now, I was off the highway, right? But then, I remembered the whole ghost in the back seat situation. So, I said, my voice trembling a little, where exactly are you headed? The figure didn't answer right away. They just sat there, staring out the window as if deep in thought. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, they spoke again. Home, they said simply. Great, that cleared things up. And, uh, where's home? Again, silence. I was starting to think this ghost wasn't exactly the chatty type. Maybe I should have just kept driving and ignored them. But, you know, once you've got a ghost in your back seat, it's kind of hard to pretend they're not there. Eventually, I decided to just drive and see what happened. I figured the ghost would give me more specific directions when we got closer to wherever home was. In the meantime, I tried to focus on the road and not the fact that I had a supernatural passenger hitching a ride. After about 10 minutes of driving in uncomfortable silence, the ghost finally spoke again. Left. I nearly jumped out of my skin. Excuse me? Turn left, they repeated. I glanced at the road ahead. There was no left turn anywhere in sight. Just more trees, rain, and darkness. I was starting to think this ghost had a terrible sense of direction. There's no left turn here, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. The ghost didn't respond. They just sat there, staring straight ahead like they couldn't care less what I thought. After a few more seconds of awkward silence, I decided to humor them and make a left turn into the trees. Not my best idea. As soon as I turned, the car lurched forward and got stuck in the mud. I cursed under my breath. Perfect. Now I was stranded in the middle of the woods with a ghost during a rainstorm. But then something strange happened. The rain suddenly stopped. The trees, which had been looming overhead like some sort of haunted forest, seemed to shift and part, revealing a small dirt road that I hadn't noticed before. The ghost in the back seat just nodded, like this was exactly what they'd been expecting. Keep going, they said, their voice calm and steady. At this point, I figured I had no choice but to follow their directions. After all, if the ghost wanted me to go somewhere, I probably didn't want to find out what would happen if I refused. So, I put the car in gear and started driving down the dirt road. The further I went, the more the woods seemed to close in around me. The trees grew thicker, the air colder, and there was this strange, eerie silence that made me feel like I was driving straight into a nightmare. Eventually, I reached a small clearing. In the middle of it stood an old, run-down house that looked like it hadn't been lived in for decades. The windows were boarded up, the roof was sagging, and there was this general air of decay that made me want to turn around and get the heck out of there. But the ghost in the back seat just sighed, like they were finally home. This is it, they said, their voice full of a strange kind of longing. Thank you for the ride. Before I could even think of a response, the ghost vanished. Just poof, gone. One second they were there, the next they weren't. I stared at the empty back seat, blinking in disbelief. I had no idea what just happened, but one thing was clear, I wasn't sticking around to find out. I threw the car into reverse, backed out of the clearing as fast as I could, and sped away down the dirt road. As I drove, the rain started up again, like nothing had ever happened. 
The highway appeared up ahead, and I merged back onto it, still trying to wrap my head around everything that had just gone down. By the time I got home, I was exhausted and more than a little freaked out. But hey, at least I made it back in one piece. And now I had one heck of a story to tell. So, morale of the story? If you ever see a ghost on the side of the road, maybe just keep driving. Or, you know, at least ask them for better directions next time. It all started when I moved into my new apartment. It wasn't anything fancy, just a small place in a quiet neighborhood. The kind of area where nothing exciting ever happens. Or so I thought, my neighbor, Mr. Wilson, seemed like a nice enough guy at first. He was an older man, maybe in his late 50s, with graying hair and a habit of wearing the same plaid shirt every day. The only thing odd about him was that he always seemed to be in his garden, no matter the time of day or night. I'd see him out there, tending to his plants, his back bent over as if he were searching for something in the soil. At first, I didn't think much of it. I mean, everyone has their hobbies, right? Some people collect stamps, some play golf, and apparently, Mr. Wilson loved gardening. But then, strange things started happening. It began with the noises. In the middle of the night, I'd hear what sounded like shoveling coming from Mr. Wilson's backyard. At first, I convinced myself it was just my imagination, or maybe the neighborhood stray digging through the trash. But the noises continued, growing louder and more frequent. One night, curiosity got the best of me, and I decided to take a look. I peered out my window, which faced Mr. Wilson's backyard. The moonlight cast long shadows across the garden, and there, in the middle of it, was Mr. Wilson. He was digging, but not in the way someone would plant flowers. No, he was digging furiously, like he was trying to bury something, something big. I tried to convince myself it was nothing. Maybe he was just really dedicated to his garden, or perhaps he had lost something important. But as the nights went on, the digging continued, and I couldn't shake the feeling that something wasn't right. I mean, who gardens at three in the morning? The next day, I decided to confront him, or at least try to bring it up casually. As I stepped outside, I saw Mr. Wilson standing by his fence, looking as though he had been waiting for me. His usual smile was absent, replaced by a blank expression that sent a shiver down my spine. Morning, Mr. Wilson, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. You've been busy with the garden, huh? He looked at me for a long moment before answering. Yes, it's important to keep things tidy. There was something unsettling about the way he said it, like there was a hidden meaning behind his words. I forced a smile and nodded, making some excuse about having to leave for work. But as I turned to go, I noticed something odd. The ground near where he had been digging the night before was freshly covered with dirt, as if he had just buried something. The next few days passed uneventfully, though I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. Every time I stepped outside, I felt Mr. Wilson's eyes on me, tracking my every move. And the noises, oh, the noises, they never stopped. They changed, though. Instead of shoveling, it sounded more like something, or someone, scratching at the ground, desperate to get out. One evening, as I sat in my living room, I heard a loud knock on the door. My heart raced as I opened it, only to find no one there. But just as I was about to close the door, I noticed a small package on my doorstep. There was no return address, just my name written in neat block letters. I hesitated, but curiosity got the better of me, and I brought the package inside. As I opened it, a strange smell hit me, something earthy, like damp soil mixed with something else, something metallic. Inside the box was a single mud-covered glove. My stomach turned as I realized it was the same kind of glove I had seen Mr. Wilson wearing in his garden. But what was it doing here, and why was it covered in mud? I couldn't make sense of it, but I knew one thing for sure. I had to find out what Mr. Wilson was hiding in his garden. That night, I waited until the noises started again. The shoveling was louder this time, almost frantic. I grabbed a flashlight and quietly made my way to the fence separating our yards. The moon was hidden behind thick clouds, making the night even darker, 
and every small sound seemed amplified. My heart pounded in my chest as I peeked over the fence. Mr. Wilson was there, digging like a madman, but this time he wasn't alone. Something was lying in the dirt beside him, a long black bag. My breath caught in my throat as I realized what it looked like, a body bag. I stumbled backward, my mind racing. Should I call the police, confront him? But before I could decide, Mr. Wilson stopped digging. He straightened up and slowly turned towards the fence, towards me, as if he could sense I was there. His eyes met mine, and I swear I saw a flash of something sinister in them, something cold and inhuman. I bolted back into my house, locking the door behind me. My hands were shaking as I tried to think of what to do next. But before I could act, there was another knock on the door, this time more forceful, more urgent. I didn't want to answer it, but I knew I had to. With a deep breath, I opened the door, only to find Mr. Wilson standing there, his plaid shirt stained with dirt, and something else, something dark. His eyes were wild, and he had that glove in his hand, the same glove that had been left on my doorstep. I believe this is yours, he said, holding it out to me. I stared at him, my mind going blank. What? What do you want? His smile was anything but friendly. I just wanted to make sure everything was tidy. Before I could respond, he turned and walked away, disappearing into the night. I stood there for what felt like hours, the glove still clutched in my hand. I didn't sleep that night. How could I? Every time I closed my eyes, I saw Mr. Wilson's face, his crazed eyes staring into mine. The next morning, I decided to take action. I went straight to the police, telling them everything about the digging, the noises, the glove, and the body bag. They listened, though I could tell they were skeptical. But they agreed to send someone to check it out. When the officers arrived, I watched from my window as they knocked on Mr. Wilson's door. He answered with his usual calm demeanor, as if nothing was wrong. They spoke for a while, then he led them to the garden. My heart pounded as I waited, expecting them to uncover something horrifying. But after a few minutes, they left, their expressions unchanged. One of the officers came over to speak with me. We didn't find anything unusual, he said. Just a garden. Mr. Wilson says he's been working on a new flower bed. Maybe you were just hearing things? I couldn't believe it. How could they not see it? How could they not hear the screams, the scratching? But as I looked out at Mr. Wilson's garden, it appeared normal. The ground was smooth, the flowers neatly planted. There was no sign of any disturbance, no evidence of the horrors I had witnessed. The police left, and I was left standing there, staring at Mr. Wilson's garden. Had I imagined it all? Was I losing my mind? But then I saw it, just a small detail, something the police had missed. One of the flowers, a bright red tulip, was tilted slightly, as if it had been disturbed, and underneath it, I could see something peeking out from the soil, something white, a bone. My blood ran cold as I realized the truth. Mr. Wilson had fooled everyone, but he hadn't fooled me. I knew what was buried in that garden, and I knew I couldn't stay here any longer. I packed my bags that very night, leaving everything behind. I didn't care where I went, as long as it was far away from Mr. Wilson and his nightmare garden. As I drove away, I glanced back at the house one last time. Mr. Wilson was standing at the edge of his garden, watching me go. His face was calm, almost peaceful, but his eyes, they were dark, filled with secrets that I hoped I would never have to uncover. I never went back to that neighborhood, never tried to find out what happened to Mr. Wilson or his garden. But sometimes, late at night, I still hear the sounds, the shoveling, the scratching. And I wonder, what else might be buried out there, in the dark corners of our world, waiting to be uncovered? <laughs>